Welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 279. Today, we're going to be talking about coaching in-game decision-making, automating new abilities and keybinds, and who to become. Welcome to the Ask Weldon Show. Uh, my name is Weldon Green. And I'm a sports psychology trainer with nine years of experience training athletes in traditional sport and esport. I have a master's in sports science in sport and exercise psychology, and I'm also some coach. This video, I take call-in questions or live questions for you to Q&A, and on my channel, you can also check out uh, vlogs and me reacting as a sports psychologist to different settings or scenarios on sports teams uh, in esport and traditional sport and kind of interpreting them for you from the science of sports psychology perspective or exercise psychology, although not a lot of people are interested in that um, as compared to sports psychology, as you can imagine. So yeah, let's jump into the first question of the show. Remember that if you want to ask your own question, you go to anchor.fm. There you will find the podcast as well as in a, a way to call into this show. It's anchor.fm slash Weldon Green. And um, you call in your own question, you leave it there. They have a cool app on your phone that allows you to sound like you're calling into a radio station, like you got a pretty good mic, even though you're just using the one on your little uh, earpiece or whatever. So make sure to use that as your way to call in the questions. Uh, no question is too wrong for this show. Uh, if it's if you're afraid that it's dumb, don't worry, I filter. So we won't have, uh, if you have bad audio or something, or you think your question's redundant, um, I'm not going to put you in a position... To uh, be named and shamed, and also, of course, you can just leave it anonymous as well. Just put the question out there. Uh, today, the first question is from Leo, so let's listen in. Hi, well done. Leo from France again. Um, I've been coaching on Fortnite for some time now, and uh, I've been trying to create a model on how you need to play every part of the game to identify key moments of decision-making from a player and to help them create good mental image around those important timing and decision-making. Do you think creating that type of model is useful and do you have something similar in other games or other sports? And uh, how would you help players uh, develop a good mental image of what they need to do in every part of the game. Thanks a lot. Uh, great question, Leo. And let me uh, just reiterate the importance of this. This is the whole ball game. What you're talking about right right now, which is like coaching people on how to make decisions swiftly, automatically in the game. That is literally it. Like. There is an argument to be made for developmental coaching. That is that when you have somebody who's a beginner and you have a coach that's an expert and you can take them through a set st set of steps, like a, a predetermined set of processes where they will slowly improve their skills through drills, um, that is like developmental coaching. It's it's the, the basics of, of getting people you know from point A to point B in a sport. But when you are at the top end or when you're dealing with um, a sport that is not formalized like for example league of legends or overwatch or literally any of the esports there is they have not been around long enough to know even how to take a beginner to an expert in these sports so you kind of have to discover it as you go so what you're doing is you are helping the player that you are coaching or the team that you're coaching to pull see patterns in the game that are productive and then to essentially build a mental model of, of how it is that they think or and you think is the best way to navigate the game. And then to make that an automatic decision-making process, you know, uh, what they call a heuristic. So essentially the answer to this question is pretty much all of coaching and everybody has their own different styles and systems and ways of doing this. Uh, so we could go on forever. Um, but the gist of it is uh, that this is what you want to do and this is what you want to get better at more and more as you practice and as you train. Now for me, uh, of course, drills are the typical way that people do this, how you create a mental model and then how you uh, automate it is you just run more and more and more drills. Um, in a lot of video games, that is very difficult to impossible because the publisher doesn't give you the tools uh, with which to create in-game scenarios over and over and over again or it's impossible even if they are the tools are there because you need for example another player uh 
who is, the, you know, the same skill level to be matched up against, and you got to run the drill over and over again, and, and you need some programming skills to make the map or whatever to set, set up the way that you want it to be. Um, and so a lot of times drills in video games are just not as rinse and repeat as sports drills are, uh, unfortunately, but you can kind of create drills within game scenarios by, by telling people to play with limitations on themselves or giving them goals to focus on for through the whole game at the expense of other things that they are working on. So one of the things that I like to do is to essentially like create, uh, create focuses uh, on certain skills, uh, I'll give you a simple example. Let's play. Say you're playing Syndra in League of Legends, which is a mid lane champion that can create like a like a little orb that does damage to everything around it at a specific spot, uh, and they can do that while they're moving. So, one of the things that you want to do with this champion is to harass the uh, the enemy player in your lane when you are farming your gold, and you try to you know harass them from farming their gold and at the same time farm your gold. So you can make that your uh, you know, sole goal is like how to cast that one spell, even at the expense of running out of mana, having to go back from your lane early, um, getting ganked and killed by the enemy jungler, being in a bad position in general, missing your own farm. Uh, you could just make it a drill where if you just focus on as a player, like landing that uh, at the same time that somebody else is last hitting or timing it with their abilities so that you can't get harassed back, things like that. So these are ways to essentially handicap your game to create within like the real ladder game like an actual ranked match a miniature mini game that is actually a drill for your players so i like to do those kinds of things to help them train better mental images of how to play but essentially the the driving engine behind all of this is you need a mirror and you need a model you need a way to see your own play and then you need a model of what the perfect uh play is so this is where you say you're talking about creating a perfect game. Um, you can kind of theory craft that. I find visualizations are stronger, so I like to have people watch really good players or watch really good plays and see the actual play. It's easier than imagining it, uh, and it's more powerful than imagining it, and then people can kind of like visualize themselves doing it as well. So I recommend uh, having players get really good at watching their own VODs and having players get really good at watching other people's VODs as well in an analytic way, not an entertainment way. And that gives you that mirror in the model for creating this mental image. And then after that, it's about the drills and the executions to kind of automate this decision-making process. Sometimes you need to write stuff out. Sometimes you need to have a heur heuristic so complex that you have to say like, okay, uh, you know, if they have one dead person, but we have all our... Um, ultimates and, and and they don't and you know these resources are this way and, and these two objectives are up uh, and lanes are even then we're going to go for this objective every single time which is a kind of heuristic you make around for example elder dragon and baron scenarios um, because if you're the winning team or the losing team you know you want to you want to do one of those things uh, a simple example is the heuristic that we created uh, like a like a simple checklist around having baron while dragon is up uh, that the the basic concept of Baron is that it is most powerful when you are near your team's minions, and so as a as the losing team or as a team without the Baron, you want to kind of draw the enemy into a dragon fight of some sort and and slowly give ground and have them waste their buff and and not fight on it, um, or uh, in the in the worst case scenario to fight really far away from the minions um, when they're not taking advantage of half of the power of their buff. Uh, that's just the theory behind it. And then, of course, um, there are there are different like reasons that you would call an audible in the game and flip that around. But that's a simple explanation of a heuristic so that you know what it is uh, so that you can kind of like talk through these black and white decision making moments in the game that you simplify by making black and white rules and then you adapt you break the rule when there's like a good reason for it. Uh, and in comms, for example, we would always say in a five person game at least that, Everybody knows the rule, and everybody does the rule automatically, and if the rule is going to be broken, then there needs to be a leader who explains why and what the new play is, essentially. So that way you kind of have a default. So I think that what you're talking about, this perfect game, creating a mental model, and then helping them to train it, that's, that's everything. That's all that you're going to be doing as a coach from now until the end of coaching. So good luck, and I hope that you find your own kind of like mixture of art and science uh, in Pathway as you go through it. And remember that it really comes down to the individual level almost in every case, not even the team level, I'm talking the individual level of how it is that they learn 
uh, and what can best stick with them. Thanks for the question. Okay, announcements. I got something right here. Um, right. Basically, it was what I already said before, that you can check out my channel uh, for the this Ask Weldon Show podcast, Anchor.fm, to call in questions. And um, I really need ideas for what it is you want commentary on. I used to do this a lot where I would essentially pick a video or a clip of a video that had a lot of sports psychological elements that were being discussed or that were being talked around without even being known at. And I would explain it from the scientific perspective of what we know in the field uh, right now in sports psychology. Um, so if you have any clips you want to submit for that, uh, my Discord, which is, of course, also in the description of this video, is a great place to check that out. Uh, and if you want to book a training session with me, you can now book a one-on-one training session in on Gamersensei.com. You'll find my profile link below by the automated training, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but I think the link is gamersensei.com slash senseis slash my name's Weldon. All right, let's jump into question number two, also from Leo. Where'd it go? All right, here it goes. Hi, Weldon. Leo from France here. And uh, I was wondering in your last show, you talked about the different type of uh, meditation, city training, sport mindfulness, walking, and is there a different use for a type of meditation? And uh, which type would you use for every public? Like for children, what type would you use? For people who just seek well-being and happiness, which type would you use? For his poor athletes, which type would you use? And uh, for those who are wondering, the Mac program is really, really great. It had a huge impact in my life, and it can maybe have the same on yours. So go try out. And thanks, well done for answering my question. It really helped a lot. You're welcome. Thanks for plugging the Mac program. I was going to do that next, mindgames.gg. Uh, it's essentially my video course where I train mindfulness, acceptance, commitment, which is a which is kind of like a model, a base model of general resilience for sport and sports psychology. Of course, I wrap it up around sports psychology performance, but it's really adapted to any sort of performance, um, which includes from public speaking all the way to even sex is considered a performance. And some treatments for uh, problems in the bedroom are chemical and some are uh, performance in nature, psychological. So you can, uh, you can find a sports psychologist for that. Type of performance, or well, at least a performance psychologist. All right. Um, so what type of meditation would I use for issues in the bedroom? Uh, no, that was not the question. What was the question? The question was, what type of meditation would you use? Um, what would you recommend? Like I was talking about in, my previ- in a previous video, uh, that there's walking and there's... Pardon me for a sec. That there's walking, mindfulness, seated mindfulness, uh, meditation training you know, chewing mindfulness. There's all sorts of different mindfulness activities. So what mindful, and sport mindfulness, by the way. What kind of uh, mindfulness activities are suited for which tasks? Well, you have to understand that the goal is sport mindfulness. That's not something that you practice. That's like what you want to have. So we're trying to get there and you might have to do drills that are non-topical in order to get there. It's the same way that you, when you want to get a really good shot in a soccer game, you don't just play a bunch of soccer games and then take a bunch of shots. That's just a component of it. But you do a, you, you know, you grab a bag of balls and you take a bunch of soccer or football shots, if you're from Europe, uh, in an empty field with a goal until you get good at it. Uh, so yes, we want sport mindfulness. We want to be always centered and 100% focused on the task in the sports match or in our performance with no distractions or at least for the distractions to pop up but not to occupy our focus and our attention. We want to regulate our attention onto the task at hand uh, in an appropriate emotional context too. So sport mindfulness isn't something that you like do as an activity. It is instead uh, the outcome of doing things like seated mindfulness. And the correct mindfulness to do at any given time is the one that you're motivated to do and that you can do. So, for example, it's really hard to do seated, eyes closed mindfulness in the middle of a band concert or when your kids are running around in the kitchen and uh, need fed. But you could, like, for example, wash some dishes and make that a mindful task for you. Um, so there's there's limitations on like what you can do at a given time and then what you're motivated to do at a given time. So let's just say like all 
all bets off what is the most appropriate and, and productive um, if, if, you, if you could do anything. And I think a lot of people would tell you, oh, you should do seated meditation, you know, that, that, for an hour or something. That's probably the best because that's what people do. But there's this story, this anecdote I'll share. It's like a Buddhist proverb. I'm not really sure where it's from. I think that I read it in the book by the, uh, the Chicago Bulls coach, actually. Uh, and it talks about this monk who was an ascetic. So he was living in a cave for, you know, 20 years and he was working on himself. He was doing a lot of meditation and he uh, elevated himself, you know, above his humanity. He really, really got totally centered. And then there was, um, he came down from the mountain and there was a lot of noise in the town. And he thought, well, what is that? What is the, what is the noise that I'm hearing? And as he drew closer to the crowd, he saw that there was a parade that day. And the parade was going along the street and everybody from the town was lining the streets and cheering and bustling around. And that was the noise that had like kind of triggered him, his, uh, his descent from the cave to figure out curiously what was going on in the town down below that day. And as he got to the back of the crowd, he, he wanted to see what was up and he tried to uh, kind of move his way forward a little bit, uh, politely, of course. And a kid ran by and stepped on his foot trying to get worm his way through the crowd to get to the front. And the guy grabbed the kid by the shoulder because it really hurt when he stepped on him. And in his mind, he was angry at him and was about to wrench him. And then he realized what he was about to do. He realized that his emotions had risen up like a tiger and essentially almost taking control of his body. And he ran back up to his cave to meditate for another 10 years. Uh, the point being that your skill when you're sitting in a quiet room alone is not the skill is not the same skill that you need to do when you're on a battlefield. So when you're a soldier, you can't just meditate uh, in a quiet room alone and then expect those skills to apply to uh, a situation where you're facing somebody else in armed combat. It just doesn't work like that. Each skill is discrete. So the skill of how not to get annoyed when somebody steps on your foot in the crowd is best trained by doing the skill of getting your foot stepped on in a crowd and dealing with it. Uh, and, and and finding some way of like building that up, right? It's the, it's the contextual training that is relevant. So yes, it's good to have a baseline of, okay, this is the this is what I need to do when I have to sit in a quiet room alone and regulate my attention while my eyes are closed. But you might notice when you're playing a lot of video games, usually your eyes are open. So already we have a, we have a wrench thrown in the works there. All right, so I would recommend a heavy mixture of doing the kind of mindfulness that you're motivated to do in the in the places that you can do it with a nice little uh, kickstart of seated mindfulness training to kind of learn the basics. It's really hard to do mindfulness when you're walking around the house trying to clean things up and, and people are running around making a lot of noise or when you're trying to help your parents with chores and you got the emotions of your siblings or your or your school filtering in. So yeah, it's great to kind of drill the basics while you're quiet and you can think. But you need to bring those skills out into the world. You need to drive mindfully. Um, I, had a, I had a great student who messaged me once. Uh, I think I even ended up having a conversation with him. He used his Mac program to become the best possible pizza delivery driver that he could. He was always driving mindfully. He was trying to be aware of all stimuli that were coming into his, his ears and his sensation of touch the feel of the chair, uh, sorry, the seat of the car, the feel of the steering wheel, the entire palette of vision that he saw and all the elements in it at all times. Um, and then, and then like routing, like picking the most perfect route, uh, in every situation, tracking himself and his car through the space. So there's a real element to, of artistry to fitting mindfulness and full focused attention that is regulated away from distractions and onto the task uh, in, in every single thing that you do. Um, it's easy for performance situations because they're so stressful that they really drive your brain into that mode. Right now, I'm pretty fully focused on this, for example, um, this public speaking that I'm doing. A lot of people, when they're playing a ranked match, you know, they still get that buzz. Maybe not people who play only ranked matches. You know, it's kind of like detuned for them. But for most people, you're really, the, you're, when you're keyed up, you're in it. And it's all of the other kind of mundane times of life where you have already mentally checked out. You don't even notice where your feet are step treading on the sidewalk anymore. You don't even notice 
the things that are on the shelf that were there a year and a half ago that you haven't even seen as you've overlooked them every single time. I actually came back to my house recently and I noticed that there were three mugs that the uh, previous uh, visitors had not washed. They had gotten so used to seeing the mugs sitting on the counter that when they washed up everything to leave the house, their brain skipped right over them because they had become fixtures for them. You know, they didn't see them. They were invisible. It's these kinds of uh, sen- sensual inputs or sensorial like inputs th- into the brain that mindfulness is saying, no, we should, we should see these things like with a baby's eyes, like fresh, you know, so that the brain is noticing it all over again. If you can get to that point, then you could say that your attention is, is very controllable and very well-tuned. Uh, and very th- and um, very good at, at essentially full task focus, right? Non the non distracted mind. So I hope that that was helpful for you. I hope that that gave you some context as to how it is to train mindfulness for sport. I recommend always after the base level of of training uh, to immediately start doing it in action all the time and try to incorporate it into your sport as much as possible in as many ways as you can. Um, yeah. So good luck. And going back to the point that you made, uh, check out the Mac program, mindgames.gg. It is currently being appified by me, so it's not currently a very good app because I'm, I'm, it's kind of like a one-man show. It's an app in progress, but it's based on a very successful video course, which I created, 50 sessions. Uh, I think it's like more like 47, actually. Um, designed to teach you from the basics to the advance of mindfulness, acceptance, commitment for esport performance or performance in general uh, in different aspects of your life. And you can still access the old video course from the sidebar of the app once you, once you are in. Uh, so you can progress through it as before. And I try to get updates in every month on, on the actual app itself. Should be finished this year, but it's a self-funded project. So slow going. All right, let's jump into the last two questions of the show. This one is from Problem Solver Learner. Maybe Problem Solving Learner? Let me check his real name here. My apologies. Problem Solver Learner. Hey, Weldon. How do people figure out who they want to be? There's an exercise in the Mac program where you ask us to articulate our values. Um, How would I want to be remembered? I'm in the process of reinventing myself and after so many iterations over a decade of work experience, I gotta say, I haven't, I still haven't figured it out and it may be a never ending thing. I think there's no upper limit to who I think I could be and that's intimidating because uh, I want to be realistic about my time and what I can hope to achieve in life. I don't know if that makes sense or if that's a good question, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, you're kind of wrestling with a difficult concept, which is how do you live the rest of your life regretting the path not taken? Um, How do you live the rest of your life thinking like, oh, I could have done this other thing. Did I choose right? I invested my time in this thing because I thought that I could do it. I did it to 80%, 85% of what I thought I could do, but I didn't make it all the way as I imagined and believed in myself that I could. Uh, you know, to the top of the corporate ladder or to the kind of revenue I wanted from my home business or to the marriage and the number of kids that I wanted and the kind of house and yard that I wanted. Um, so how do, you, how do you be settled with your choice now? And how do you be settled with the bridging of time where you say, like, this is the path I took and the TVA over here has the other branch and it's been pruned? Um, a Loki reference there for those of you who are into pop culture right now on Netflix. But um, essentially, I don't have a lot of advice for this. I'm still living it myself. Uh, I know that I'm lucky because I'm pretty satisfied with the decisions that I've made. Um, And I just try to always not have any regret because I am who I am. And there's a lot of forgiveness that goes in with that. But I I have a model for that. You know, I have a system. I'm Catholic. And we have a a certain belief structure that we can lean into for that understanding of the universe and the choices that we make. But this is a different journey for every single person. And I'm not saying that you should just lean on a crutch like religion or that it even is a crutch, for example. 
It could be uh, a stepping stool, for example. Um, but I think that I just need to know more about the context of your situation to give more discreet advice. But I was, if I was going to give general advice to all the listeners here, I would say uh, you got to think about how it is to deal with the consequences of your choices. Um, and then, of course, you, you, you make pros and cons and you eventually decide something. And you, and you do that thing and you're going to be there in 15 years. You're going to be looking back at the decisions you made and the skill that you're going to need is the one of forgiveness for yourself, uh, not regretting the path that you didn't take and kind of the ability to stay focused and honed in on something that you feel like is going to make a difference for you personally and for the universe at large. And I would go very narrow and very wide. I wouldn't bother with anything in between like what's the best for my nation and for my city and for my world and let's make the world a better place with Facebook and all these kind of like startup y style like let's make humans better you know let's help people really connect on on a new way of doing a dating app you know or something like that Um, I would say what is your belief about what contributes kind of to the universe at large and what is your view on yourself and the people that you're connected to intimately nearby. Those are the things that you, you should make decisions on and then everything in the middle will sort itself out if you have their morality pointed in the right directions there. So that's my advice for you. Good luck. Hope you make the right decision. All right, last question from Elver. Hello, Welton. I'm trying to incorporate the target champions only feature in my gameplay on ATZ, but I can't seem to remember to actually press the button I pointed it to. Do you have any tips slash ideas on how I could incorporate it in my gameplay? Thanks. All right. Uh, this kind of goes in with the first question from Leo, right? Uh, how is it that you automate a motor skill? Um, and the answer I gave there was drills, right? Drills, drills, drills. But the nitty gritty of how you do those drills really determines how fast it's going to, it's going to take. And my advice is you can't allow any repetitions that don't involve the use of the new ability while you're still learning it. So I would, for example, play a bot game or a number of, uh, you know, AI versus bot or five versus AI or some unranked games and I would only hold down target champions only, you know? And if you need a last hit, just try to use a skill shot or like an AOE spell or something and time it right. And in the meanwhile, you're just literally just harassing your opponent in the minion wave. That's all you're doing. Drawing the minions to you and harassing them over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, hopefully you play a jungler, not a jungler, hopefully you play a laner, sorry, uh, that can dive, like a top lane, or support, and you're going to like build the wave and dive, you're probably going to build the wave if you're not lasting at all, right? Um, so yeah, play some games where you just like forgo an entire aspect of the game, like hitting minions in the first place, and you just hold down that skill, and you just turret dive with it, and you skirmish with it, and you fight in the wave and harass with it, and you just lift up your finger every single time, press it down again every single time, but use it and only it. Target champions only. That's it. Do that for like three to five games and then do it the next day for your warm up, and then start incorporating it into your regular game. Uh, make some sort of rule like uh, I'm going to harass them every single time that they come to last hit and I have a CD up. So every single time your Q is on cooldown or something like that, you're going to harass them and then try to remember to use uh, target champions only for that. Uh, and otherwise you can last hit, you know, and hit the minions. All right. That's my advice. Good luck. And that's the show for today. So make sure to um, check out on Twitch, by the way, twitch.tv slash mindgameswelden if you want to watch this live. And I will see you all tomorrow.